Cardiology Burst Part 4. Name the early diastolic heart sound that is often heard with constrictive pericarditis. An early diastolic heart sound, constrictive pericarditis. This is a pericardial knock. Pericardial knock, it's a high-pitched early diastolic heart sound heard in constrictive pericarditis. And what is the other common physical exam finding in constrictive pericarditis? Kussmaul sign, exactly. Kussmaul sign, this is an increase in jugular venous distension upon inspiration. Remember, when one inspires, there's an increased venous return. But if you have constricted, a constricted pericardium, the increased venous return will not move forward, but rather it'll get backed up in the neck veins. And that's due to an impairment in mid to late diastolic filling. So real simple, real nice physiology behind the pericardial knock of constrictive pericarditis. The knock is due to an abrupt cessation during diastolic filling, and that's due to a thickened inelastic pericardium. Now importantly, early diastolic filling is not impeded. It's actually completely normal, but then you get an abrupt cessation, and that causes a knock. And this occurs pretty early in diastole. Now cardiac tamponade, that's a different story. Tamponade does not have a pericardial knock for multiple reasons. So number one, in cardiac tamponade, the pericardium is elastic, whereas in constrictive pericarditis, it's stiff. Second of all, in cardiac tamponade, early diastolic filling is impeded, whereas in constrictive pericarditis, early diastolic filling is normal. And finally, number three, in tamponade, you have muffled heart sounds to begin with, so that makes everything more hard to hear. So again, the two most common physical exam findings in constricted pericarditis, number one, Kussmaul sign, which is an increase in JVD upon inspiration, and number two, a pericardial knock, and that's a high-pitched early diastolic heart sound. And what are the, what are the most common causes of constricted pericarditis? So there's several. Number one, acute pericarditis. That can lead to constrictive pericarditis. Number two, radiation. Number three, idiopathic, meaning we don't know. Number four, cardiac surgery. Number five, infectious. So tuberculosis classically associated with constrictive pericarditis. There's other two, others too, but these are the most common. Never forget about radiation, so people having a history of radiation exposure, and number two, tuberculosis. Next, following an acute MI, name two causes for a sudden, prominent V wave on pulmonary capillary wedge pressure tracing. And I'll give you a hint the V wave is atrial filling pressure, the A wave is the atrial kick. So after an acute MI, can you think of two causes for a sudden, prominent V wave? And the V wave is atrial filling pressure. So number one, mitral regurgitation, and number two, acute ventricular septal defect. So these, of course, are worrisome complications of an acute MI. Another potentially fatal complication of MI is a free wall rupture. Now that's just gonna to lead to cardiac tamponade and imminent hemodynamic compromise. But if you see in a day, two, three days after an acute MI, if all of a sudden you're seeing um, an increased V wave on your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure tracing, you wanna think about acute mitral regurg. Uh, and this would be the papillary muscle rupture or number two, an acute ventricular septal defect. Now these all increase blood flow into the atrium, so that's why you get increased atrial filling pressure. So you have more blood in the atrium, your V wave is gonna be more prominent. All right, next. Will an osteum primum atrial septal defect present with right axis deviation or left axis deviation on the ECG? So osteum primum atrial septal defects. This is going to present with left axis deviation. 
So Ostium Primum ASDs will show a left axis deviation on EKG tracing. In contrast, Ostium Secundum ASDs will give you a right axis deviation. So Ostium Secundum ASDs cause right axis deviation, and this is due to a right to left shunting and hypoxemia leading to right ventricular overload. So Primum, that's the endocardial cushion, and Secundum, that's higher up. So that's on the wall between the right and left atrium. What is the definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy? So peripartum cardiomyopathy, this is defined as a dilated cardiomyopathy with, which has a high mortality and it's typically between the last month of pregnancy and up to five months postpartum. So the last month of pregnancy and up to five months postpartum, it's the general consensus for the definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy. And how do you treat peripartum cardiomyopathy? So besides the usual heart failure treatments, you're gonna think of things like IVIG, pentoxifilline, and that's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and most recently, bromocryptine. So bromocryptine was just recently shown to improve outcomes in peripartum cardiomyopathy in a proof of concept pilot study which involved 20 patients who were randomized. Now the other thing to know about peripartum cardiomyopathy if the EF is less than 35%, thromboembolic prophylaxis is recommended. So that's also important to know. So a lot of these patients do have an EF less than 35%. All right, last, define fractional flow reserve. So what is fractional flow reserve? Okay, so this is a procedure that's often done at the time of cardiac catheterization involving a guide wire with the transducer at the tip of it. So maximal, first you take maximal coronary flow, you measure that, and then the fraction of that value that remains at the site of a lesion, that's gonna be the fractional flow reserve. So first of all, you need good coronary flow in the rest of the heart. So sometimes this just doesn't work because some, sometimes people have cancer of the heart where there's no good flow anywhere. But ideally for uh, fractional flow reserve, you take the maximal coronary flow, you measure that first, and then you go to your lesion and the fraction of that initial value that remains at the site of your lesion, that's gonna be your fractional flow reserve. So in other words, uh, fractional flow reserve is the fraction of the maximal coronary flow that exists at the site of an, of an occlusion and it's most commonly used on intermediate sized lesions. So typically an FFR below 0.75 is considered to be significant. Higher values indicate a non-significant stenosis. So bottom line, if flow is not significantly reduced, then you don't need to open up the obstruction. So FFR can be very useful from that standpoint. So usually indeterminate lesions, it can help guide further therapy. And that's it. So thanks for joining. So long and goodbye.